All right, guys, so this is the last chapter of the media module. Uh, we're still looking at support media, but this time promotional products. Um, and at the very end, we'll have some tests to sort of summarize and, and recap on everything that we've learned over the last few chapters. So here's the overview slide. So today we're combining two chapters into one. That's uh, chapter five, which is support media, and chapter six, which is some of the test items that um, we're going to use to see if you've been paying attention, I guess, um, throughout these modules. So what are promotional products or promo products? Promo products are useful tangible items that are somehow imprinted with an advertiser's name or logo or message and are designed to increase brand awareness amongst consumers. So 52% of a company is more positive when a person receives a promotional product. So if you think about um, University Orientation Week, this is the prime example of when you get some of these promo products, right? Uh, you'll get a lot of free pens with the logo or advertiser's name on it. You'll get some stress balls maybe. You might get a pair of gentles. Uh, you'll probably get some notepad or journal uh, for writing in. You might get a lapel uh, necklace. Um, you might get a fridge magnet. Uh, you might get a frisbee. You might get a cap. So all of these things are promo products. And some of these stats that I'm reading are from the APPA, which is the Australasian Promotional Products Association, and New Zealand is part of that. Um, and they provide stats on their own research based on how successful promo products are. So I guess you do need to take some of these stats with a grain of salt because like any sort of media supplier, they will be trying to make their um, media, and in this case, promo products, um, seem really good. 76 recall the name of um, the product that was advertised on, on that promotional product. 55% uh, of people keep that item for more than a year. Um, and 52% decide to do business with the company afterwards, right? So, I mean, I don't know how accurate those stats are, but if you think about your own situation where you're at a week, you're enjoying yourself, you get a free stress ball, and it tells you to do something or tells you the name of a brand, or you get a pen that you might be using right now at home. Um, without looking at that pen or that stress ball or the pair of jandals, can you tell me what brand they came from uh, they so kindly gave you this gift, um, or what message you were supposed to do. So have a think about that, um, and then consider these statistics here. Uh, and the more important one down the bottom, 52% decide to do business with the company afterwards. Okay, so that's basically saying that one in two people that receive a promotional product from a company will end up doing business with them. So we'll go and sign up with them, or buy a product of them, or hire them to do some sort of service. Okay, so that seems quite generous as well in my mind. Um, so I'd be a bit critical, and obviously with any of these media, um, when they're talking about these conversion rates, um, you have to take it with a grain of salt, and it also depends on the creative element behind it, right? So if it was a company that you were you know thinking about using already and then you get a promotional product that happened to resonate with what you needed at that time in your life and then you look very favorably upon that company because that product was exactly what you needed and it reminded you of the brand at that right point in time then sure you probably would go and do business with them but for all of you out there that have received a ton of promo products in the last few orientation events um how many of those brands have you actually gone and done something they wanted you to do, uh, such as buy their product typically, or sign up, or do whatever social message they said that you should do, right? So yeah, think about some of these stats with a grain of salt, but also, you know, be open to it because if the creative element aligns really well with the targeting and the promo product is picked uh, in a way that really suits the audience's needs, then it could all click together and you might get some stats as favorable as these ones here. Um, and apparently 74% of office workers have some sort of promotional product. This I do believe. I mean, we all have. I mean, I'm, the pens I use typically are, are from promo products. I buy very few pens myself. I think they are all based on freebies. So what are some other things to consider about promo products? Okay, sometimes it's called speciality advertising. As I mentioned before, it's all those things that you get for free at expos or at orientation events or concerts, etc. So stationery is a famous one, you know, USB pens, mugs, t-shirts, uh, calendars, uh, caps, 
uh, all that sort of stuff. I mentioned the APPA, so they're the Australasian Promotional Products Association. So I was actually invited by them a couple of years ago uh, for two years in a row to be a judge to decide which of um, the promotional campaigns that were going around in New Zealand deserved to, to win uh, their supreme award. So I'll use those as a case study a bit later on. Um, but it was a really interesting experience and it really opened my eyes up to this whole area of promo products, um, which I do believe is a really strong um, component of an integrated marketing communications campaign. So some strengths are obviously that selectivity. You basically decide uh, who is getting the product, so you can be as specific as you want by mailing it directly to the person. Um, you could even get people to sign up and receive a promotional product, so then you're getting very, very good um, data and you're building your database. So this works really well with direct marketing. Uh, but you can also be selective in terms of the type of product you're deciding to give out, right? Because, you know, if you're a certain brand, then sending USBs, branded USBs, are going to to, you know, work slightly different for you than if you're a different brand and you decide to use baseball caps. They're flexible, so basically if you can think of any product, you can turn it into a promo product. Um, and there are companies out there that manufacture these products uh, specifically for the promotional products industry. Then there's a whole other set of um, decorators, they're called, which are companies that do the printing onto these products, right? And then you get a whole other set of companies that are distributors that actually end up getting that product that's now been printed um, to the ad agency for them to activate during their brand experience um, events. Um, you get frequent exposure. So in the previous slide, you know, 74% of people had one of these and they keep them for over a year. And so you are exposed to these brands. Um, I mentioned that already, people keep them for a year. Uh, it's fairly low cost per exposure. Some of these products are very cheap. If you think about the cost of buying pens in bulk and then the added cost of maybe printing your brand logo on it, still not very expensive compared to like a TV ad, right? Um, you get this goodwill, so this idea of reciprocity. Right? You've given someone something for free, they obviously feel a little bit more favorable towards your brand, so that's good. And high recall, right? So once again, I mean, that number seems pretty high. How many brands can you recall of the free stuff that you've been given in just the last year? So this most recent orientation. Have a think about that now, right? Those pair of jandals that you got. Who were they from? What, what message did they have? Um, did you get a stress ball? Did you get a couple of pens? What was the brand of the pen that you got given for free? Can you remember? Right, um, and it works as a good supplement to uh, other aspects of the IMC or integrated marketing communications, right? So you still need the other stuff. You still need your print or your TV or your radio or your you know general advertising or your, your PR and your sponsorship or your sales promotion. All that stuff works together. Um, the promo products acts as a very tangible uh, manifestation of your brand that, that you can literally give to someone and they have it in, in their hands and it builds that goodwill. Um, but will it make them go to the shop and buy your product or sign up with your service? You know, that's a whole other uh, level that you have to consider. That conversion rate um, is always very tricky um, to, to calculate. What are some cons or so some weaknesses of the promo product area? Now, if you don't do it properly, you can risk cheapening your brand. And by that, I mean, imagine if you've got those jandals or the pen and it's got that brand emblazoned on it and then you use the pen and it literally shatters underneath the pressure of your handwriting, right? Or you wear a jandal and the front bit pops open and you stub your toe. Uh, that's not going to do any favors for that brand. And so part of the APPA's mission is to, you know, um, create some credibility and legitimacy and professionalism around the promo products area. And so the suppliers they use have to fulfill some pretty strict standards in terms of producing products that are safe, that are of high quality, that won't cheapen the brand, uh, any brand that is associated with that. Um, but, you know, that there's still that risk there that a product that you associate your brand with um, not only might be substandard in quality, but maybe has nothing to do with the actual uh, purpose of your brand. It is a very cluttered environment. So when promo products were first um, popular, you know, it was not as usual. And so therefore things stood out and people would remember it. But if you think about that bag of goodies that you get when you go to an expo or at orientation week, there's a lot of stuff in there. 
And with clutter means lack of attention paid to any one item, right? And it's the same thing that most other media are suffering, uh, and that is the cluttered environment. There's a fairly long lead time because if you have to source the um, supplier to make the product, uh, to get it back over to the country you're operating in, to get the printing done either at the place after manufacturer or within your local domestic area, uh, you need to ship that stuff then, then you need to get it to a place where it can be distributed, um, and then you need to actually activate it and start to get it sent out. So from the moment you decide you want to send USBs with your brand to when the customer actually gets your USB uh, with, with the brand name on it, you know, there is going to be a lead time there. And some of the distributors and um, decorators and agencies that work together have streamlined this process, um, but there's still, you know, a little bit of planning that needs to occur. It's not like a newspaper where you can literally have an idea and get it into print within in less than less than a week. There are um, obvious sustainability concerns, right? And this is similar to that previous lecture on packaging, but with promo products, it's obviously in a different way because now you're giving a lot of stuff. Typically, the stuff is made of plastic and it typically breaks um, fairly quickly and ends up in the landfill. And so one of the categories that they introduced um, prior to me joining as a judge on the APPA um, prize competition was this category of most sustainable promo product campaign. Um, and that was a really good category because it was good to see how some of these companies were thinking in terms of not just giving out free plastic stuff like pens or jandals, but also thinking about stuff that they could give out that would build a brand image, but also not contribute to the landfill. So here are some examples I talked about that were the finalists, uh, contestants in the APPA um, 2017 um, awards. Um, so Huggies had this uh, promotional product where it was Kiwi Anna styled wooden uh, baby toys. Uh, and you'd collect a certain amount of um, barcodes and you sign up online and then after a certain amount you get this, um, this promotional product um, sent to you. Uh, this other entry was for a, um, a cement manufacturer essentially. Uh, this was more of a business to business promotional campaign. And so what happened here was this cement company changed this packaging and in order to communicate that they had changed the packaging to other tradies um, to encourage them to keep looking for the same packaging because it had changed a bit, they sent out these miniature versions or rep replicas of the new packaging with um, jelly beans in them as a you know, token of goodwill. Um, and they had limited uh, supply of those concrete pills that you see at the bottom of that slide. Uh, and on the back of those concrete pills, it said harden up. Uh, and so you could see how that as a promotional product, so they were mints basically, uh, would go down pretty well with these, you know, construction worker types uh, taking these um, concrete pills, right, to harden up. Um, but more importantly, communicated what the new brand packaging would look like, which was the main purpose, the main objective of that communications campaign. This, some of you may remember this one. So these were those KFC mini boom boxes that you could get with the purchase of um, the KFC product. Um, and you plug them into your phone and they made um, the speakers, uh, it made the sound slightly, slightly louder. Um, here is a promotional product involving a, let's say, foosball table at the top that you can't see, uh, but below it is an ice bucket where you could put um, Canadian club to cool off while you, in, in, enjoy your game of uh, foosball at the top. Um, and so that was a very high end sort of promotional campaign where you'd have to, you know, obviously save a lot in order to um, submit into a competition that would then allow you to win this, um, this table. And the final example down the bottom was the um, Olympic a program in schools that was run by ANZ. So they had a lot of promotional products uh, promoting the Olympics and obviously promoting the bank uh, in terms of school educational materials uh, and merchandise. So before I tell you which one won, um, I'll just you know, leave you sort of thinking a little bit. Um, some of the categories that we were looking at, um, you know, looked at not only how much attention um, these sorts of campaigns would get, but also the return on investment and also the sustainability um, aspect of it um, and whether or not it would help to build that brand image.
So before we do the test time, obviously Huggies was the winner of the Supreme um, uh, Supreme category, and the reason why that particular campaign won the best promotional uh, product campaign was because a it was sustainable so these things were made of wood and but they were made to last more importantly and they became an heirloom and a collectible item that you would that we could foresee um, you know kids hanging on to and passing down to their younger siblings and maybe in the future even their you know their own kids um, and so that was a really big tick in terms of not just giving more plastic crap out um, the second reason why we thought it, it, was um, deserving of the supreme winner was because it, of the return on investment, right? Um, the number of points a person would have to collect would guarantee a certain level of brand loyalty to Huggies, right? They're going to keep buying this product until they can get that free promotional product. And then there are two more products to collect. Um, and so that really ensured that repeat purchase. Um, so essentially, the promotional product, however much it costs, would probably end up paying for itself through the cumulative profit margin of the consumers continually going back and purchasing that brand of Huggies. Um, and thirdly, we thought that it really lent itself for future campaigns, for future iterations where a different set of toys could be, could, could be created um, you know, in several years time, which would then give Huggies another sort of um, breath of fresh air in terms of this, this classic campaign and actually turn it into something that was almost nostalgic. Um, so for those reasons and a host of other reasons, we thought that that was the supreme winner in the New Zealand category of the APPA um, promotional campaign awards. Right. So now focusing on this test time, we've got a few questions here. So the first one, an advertiser of designer jewelry will want to use a certain type of advertising. So a certain type of um, media channel there if she wants to convey elegance, quality and snob appeal. So the right answer there is magazine because we established in the print um, chapter of this module that magazines were very good at not only selecting particular um, demographics, but also providing a prestigious medium for fashion, um, fashion products, um, such as Vogue was the example that I used. Um, so se second question here, an advantage of ma magazine advertising is so there's several options there, low intrusiveness, long lead times, selectivity, clutter, all of the answers supply for this question are correct. Um, so this is a fairly easy one. Um, there's only one advantage listed there, and that is selectivity. The other three, such as low intrusiveness, uh, long lead times, and clutter are not advantages at all. Right, continuing on with the test time, one limitation of out-of-home advertising is lack of geographic flexibility, high cost per thousand, narrow reach and frequency, inability to pinpoint specific market segments, or none of these answers are correct. So the correct answer there is an inability to pinpoint specific market segments. So you recall during the billboard ad, um, lecture, I talked about how you could reach a whole bunch of different people and you could put a billboard up almost anywhere, but it was very difficult then to, to, to know exactly who you were reaching, right? You got the person, the business person driving into town, or you got the tradie going to a job, or you've got the student catching catching the bus to, to school, right? You really don't know who's on that arterial route. Um, the other three, A, B, and C options are actually not limitations um, because you know, lack of geographic f flexibility is not true. Um, it doesn't have a high cost per thousand. And we just mentioned that it has high reach and frequency level is fairly high too, because it's the people passing uh, within traffic, both in the morning to go to work and in the evening on the way home. So none of those are limitations that apply to billboards. Um, the period immediately preceding prime time is known as prime access. So this is um, in the table, if you recall, in the broadcast uh, lecture, which was the first lecture in this uh, module. And prime access at that time, just before prime time, uh, where people are sort of having dinner. And so it's still a pretty desirable time to have, but not quite as good as that traditional prime time, which is after dinner and people are, you know, theoretically gathered around the couch and, and watching TV. So. Continuing on with test time, we have these two further questions. According to the view model, which is to do with packaging, visibility signifies the ability of the package to, and you should remember this, attract attention, right? Um, 
you could argue it is to display the brand name as well, but the most correct answer is to attract attention because you have to attract attention first before someone will recognize your brand name on that package. And the final question here, which of the following is not a problem with TV advertising? Is it because it's expensive? Is it that TV viewing audiences are eroding? Is it because they're getting fractionalized or fragmented? Is it clutter? Or is it that it cannot achieve impact? Okay, well, the only right answer there is E because all four are actually things that are bad for TV advertising or are a problem with TV advertising, right? It's expensive, TV audiences are eroding because they're, they're split across so many different types of media now. Uh, they're also fractionalized as an audience, so you can no longer have one program that reaches a lot of people. You need to use different ways of um, communicating with them in order to get the same number of people now. Uh, there is a very cluttered environment in terms of TV advertising, but certainly also in other um, media as well. Uh, but the main uh, thing that is not a problem with TV advertising is its ability to achieve impact. So it can achieve impact, so to speak. Hence, that is not a problem for TV advertising. Right, so just to summarize the final slide in this module uh, about media. So we started off with broadcast media. And for that, we looked at TV and radio. We saw that there are still many advantages for TV, even though the audience is eroding and being fractionalized, etc., etc. It's still one of the best ways of communicating to a lot of people at the same time. Radio is also a very good supplementary media, and it's able to build this relationship with local audiences um, through use of you know uh, local personalities and DJs. Then we looked at print, so this was newspaper and magazines, and we decided that particularly magazines were highly selective, uh, allowing for really high involvement messages because people are controlling the pace at which they're you know, processing the information on a magazine, which means they can also process the pace that they approach your ad with. Um, similar to you know other media, it's also very cluttered uh, and the audiences are fragmented. And, and in terms of print, the um, audiences are declining because of social media and other ways of getting that same content, right? Uh, and so there is this need to adapt to the internet of things. And you'll see that a lot of these um, print companies, publishing companies have moved online and they're providing a lot of information and content through those, uh, those platforms because they realize that is where the audience is headed. Um, then we looked at support media, uh, out of home advertising. So these were things like billboards and transit advertising. And then we spent a bit of time on ambient media. Um, so they're on the rise because they can be used quite creatively, creatively, and they're pretty good cost, um, uh, per thousand. In other words, they're quite cost effective. Then in terms of packaging and promo, we, established that they are a very critical part of the communication process um, because they are a tangible manifestation of the communication that all the advertising has built up to. Because at the end of the day, someone still has to go to the shop to buy that product, right? Or they have to go into the office and sign up. And so packaging in terms of products works in that manner in that they are a tangible um, thing that the customer can touch and feel before they make that purchase decision. And promo products act in a similar way for those companies that aren't dealing with an actual product, right? So insurance companies and banks are a great example where they will use promo products because their actual product is very difficult to to get a sort of feel for, right? Because it's an intangible service. And so they will use promotional products to establish that physical bond by giving you um, a free cap or pen or stress ball. Uh, and then hopefully that goodwill you feel towards that brand because of the promo product they've given you um, will make you more likely to do business with that brand. And then finally, we finished off with some of those test items that may or may not appear in your terms test. All right, thanks guys.